so much for doing this. I'm a, a huge fan of your work. So this is a joy. Oh, for me. that's very generous. Thanks so much. Um, you know, we're celebrating 10 years of Super 8. I want to ask you a question that I have wanted to ask you for almost a decade at this point. In the audio commentary track of that film, uh, you and Larry Fong and Brian Burke are uh, trying to get Steven Spielberg to answer a question, and he does not respond to the email during the commentary. I was wondering if he ever responded to that email. Uh, I believe the question was, why don't you do DVD commentaries? Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, you know, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> that was 10 remember. years ago, so I apologize. I don't remember if he ever responded, but, um, you know, I, I think that uh, if I could guess, I think it's that he sort of likes to, you know, keep his sort of secrets to, uh, to himself. But um, I, don't, I don't know if he ever responded to that, uh, but I'll ask him again. Okay. Yeah, I know your guys' <laughs> gambit was that was the way to get him to actually do a DVD commentary. That's so why reading uh, his, his answer well, on it. I, uh, that's true, actually. I, I, I wish he had, but I, um, I, will, I will try to find out, though. Okay. Um, well, I know that, the, you know, the legend behind this movie is that it, it was two stories. One uh, was about kids with super eight cameras making their own little movies, and then one was like an alien one that was combined. I was curious, is that true? I mean, that's kind of the lore around, uh, you know, how the story was created. You know, when I, when I reached out to Stephen to ask if, if he would be interested in doing uh, a movie called Super 8 about kids making Super 8 movies. Uh, and he said, yes, I didn't really necessarily have in my head that, that there would be a monster. Although I think I, I, I had the thought that there would be some intrigue that they would sort of stumble upon, uh, you know, in a kind of, you know, uh, blow up, blow out sort of way where it's like, there's something, you know, that they see that, that they, uh, you know, gets them sort of sucked into a something where they're they're in over their heads and uh as steve and i started meeting and talking about what it could be this idea came up and you know i feel like while i don't think i ever completely reconciled the the two sort of genres in a, in a way i think doing something that was simply about the kids could have been um you know maybe even a a, a more satisfying story there was something given that that as we were discussing what this movie could be the the feeling of it being you know an amblin movie that it, it would feel like something sort of from that library and in fact this is the first amblin movie uh to have the the title card at the beginning of the movie as opposed to the end and i think that 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 was part of the the sort of genre mashup thing was that amblin movies traditionally did that and and it felt like something that that would have um allowed it to live on a shelf more comfortably with with those other films i know that the way you like to work you like to keep uh you know the production a little bit loose open to uh you know other creative ideas that might come about um not to say that there's not a script but you know i i know on the dvd commentary you talk about liking to work with kyle chandler because he had come from friday night lights where that was similar and i was mm -hmm. curious how working with kids uh, changes that? Like, does it make it easier or does it make it harder to kind of be open to different ideas while you're working? Well, it's a, it's a funny thing, you know, working with kids is by nature a, a, a less predictable experience. And so I think you have to go into that as much as you can, embracing the fact that you're not quite sure what you're going to get. Um, but the truth is that working with grown actors and really accomplished uh, and, and, and sort of proven actors, usually they're so good because they're going to also surprise you and 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 do something that you know changes the tone or the dynamic or or you know sometimes e even the you know the 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 physicality of a scene you know how something is is choreographed but i feel like with kids uh especially you know this group they were so sort of rambunctious and so funny together and would sort of push each other's buttons and be making each other laugh and while they were actually also really thoughtful and, and serious it was you know it was it was a funny experience being with these these kids is, and seeing how their dynamic would change enormously when Elle Fanning was on set like all of a sudden when she was there they would just you know uh act very differently and that was always every single time that was that was hilarious but you have to kind of be willing to go with the unexpected with kids and and especially given that the way who they played and what they were doing that sometimes you know running the camera without them even being aware was part of the fun of it too which is sort of like let them think that you're setting the thing up 
but you're actually rolling. And, you know, sometimes we got some, some pieces that were really, you know, great, especially in the, in the diner scene. Well, in, in talking about, you know, the monster, the monster is very much a, a metaphor for Joe's grief. And, you know, the film builds to this really emotional climax where, you know, he's talking to the monster and he's really telling the monster what he needs to hear. And I'm curious how you as the director kind of went about building towards that moment while also making a monster that is scary and terrifying and, you know, was killing people, like kind of marrying those two ideas while you're crafting the story. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, you know, the, the, the notion was, like you said, that, that this was a kid who was trying to process the loss of, of his mother and that this thing that he had to confront, who, who he had to get right up to and look in the eyes and, and who had to see him, um, yes, this thing was scary and it was awful and it was a thing of, of nightmares, uh, but it was also the thing that, that he had to connect with to understand and then to, to get past and, and to have leave him. And, you know, I, I, I often think that the, the, the movie is the story that the main character has to experience to become enlightened. And, and even though, of course, this is like a crazy nightmare, if, if, if Joe went to sleep one night, um, maybe the night of you know, his mother's memorial service and had this dream, it's not to say he'd wake up without feeling any grief, but the idea that it would have been a thing that he emotionally felt that he had uh, some kind of gauntlet that he had passed through, that he, you know, some, some kind of experience that allowed him to grapple with and, and, and overcome his grief in some way, you know, um, and, and, and allowing him to let go finally. Uh, not to say he doesn't love his mother or that he, you know, won't miss her, but the idea that he's sort of, you know, in denial in some way and sort of holding on to this thing and, and, and somehow letting go of that feels like the thing that, um, you know, that locket represents this, you know, this connection that, that he, he had to just finally be okay with her not being there. And weirdly, this ridiculous monster did that. So having scenes of, of terror or, or, you know, fear or mystery with this monster suspense, you know, where you feel that this thing is out there, it was a way of, of, you know, of dramatizing what kind of internal strife Joe was going through. Well, I'm curious, I mean, this is an original story. It's an original sci-fi film. Um, nowadays, it feels like a lot of original stories have to be packaged into IP in order for those films to get made. I'm just curious, from your perspective, do you think Super 8 would be made as is today in today's climate, or do you feel like it would have to be a Cloverfield movie? Would it have to have something, you know, giving it that extra nudge? You know, I I feel incredibly uh, grateful to Stephen for uh, doing this with me, and obviously to Paramount for letting it get made, because like you said, it's something that I think is is more anomalous than not that a, a movie would get made that didn't have some connection to it. Uh, you know, even you know, frankly, some of the movies that I've I've loved recently, like you know, even the the Invisible Man, which of course was about an invisible man, so calling it the Invisible Man makes sense. Uh, and yet, it could have been called anything. Um, it was its own story. It was a, an original and unique story. So. I, I feel like uh, I feel very lucky to have gotten to make this movie and have some other things that I, I'm, I'm working on that are also in an original space and and hope to make those as well. But, you know, time will tell. Yeah, I mean, that's not to do. I mean, Black Panther is no less brilliant because it's based on a comic. But, you know, the truth. Of oh, the totally. Is that it's totally. Far less original stories being told. Right, But I mean, but but to your point, like I've I've heard I've heard pitches for things that use existing titles but the stories that are being pitched are so specific and unique that you realize it doesn't have to be that that title. Yeah. And 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 you know, I think that that, like you said, that is sort of the norm now, which I'm curious, you know, ho hopefully will change. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. I mean, one of the things I liked about the Star Wars franchise that you guys did was that the creative handoff between you and Ryan Johnson, which I felt you know, it, it was letting filmmakers take their own stories and take take the story where they wanted to go. And I felt that played out in a really interesting way. But I know not everyone feels that way. And I'm curious for you, as the person who helped get that foundation off the ground and also concluded it, 
do you feel like that trilogy would have benefited from planning out a very strict three movie story from the very beginning? Or do you enjoy that kind of creative freedom to kind of take the characters different ways and kind of see how it goes? You know, I, I've been involved in a number of, of projects that have been, um, uh, you know, in, in most case series that have ideas that begin the thing where you feel like you know where it's going to go. And then sometimes it's an actor who comes in. Uh, other times it's a relationship that it, as it's written doesn't quite work and things that you think are going to just, you know, uh, be so well received, um, just crash and burn and other things that you think like, oh, that's a little small moment. That's a one episode character suddenly become a hugely important part of the, the story. And I feel like what I've learned as a lesson a few times now, and it's something that, that in, especially in this parent, uh, pandemic year, uh, working with writers, the lesson is that, you know, you, you have to plan things the best you can. And, and you always need to be able to respond to the unexpected and the unexpected can come in all sorts of forms. And I just, I do think that, uh, you know, there, there's, there's nothing more important than knowing where you're going. And there are projects that I've worked on where we had some ideas, but we, we hadn't worked through them enough. We had some, sometimes we had some ideas, but then we weren't allowed to do them the way we wanted to. We had, I, I mean, I've had all sorts of situations where, um, you know, uh, you, you, you plan things in, in, a, in a certain way and you suddenly find yourself doing something that's 180 degrees different. Um, and then sometimes it works really well and you feel like, wow, that really came together. And other times you think, oh my God, I can't believe this is where we are. And sometimes when it's not working out, it's because it's what you planned. And other times when it's not working out, it's because it didn't, it's like, you just, you, you never really know, but, but having a plan, you know, I have learned in some cases the hard way um, is the most, you know, critical thing because otherwise you don't know what you're setting up. You don't know what you're, you know, uh, what to emphasize, because if you don't know the inevitable of the story, you know, you're, you're just as good as your last, you know, sequence or, or effect or joke or whatever, but you want to be leading to something inevitable. For sure. Um, well, I have to wrap with you pretty soon, but I did want to ask, and I know full well the irony of this question, but because of the people involved, I'm excited about it. The Superman movie, as someone who has written a Superman movie before that didn't go into production, I was curious what uh, sparked to you about ta Coates about having him write, uh, you know, a Superman movie, a, uh, a new version of this character. Well, I, I, I honestly cannot wait um, and would love to, to talk about it with you uh, when the time is right. Um, but I will just say it's something that, that we are incredibly excited about. And I think that anyone who gets to work with ta is blessed. So I feel very lucky to, uh, to get to be collaborating with him. Well, and on the original side, a uh, project of yours I'm very excited for is Demimond. Uh, I hope I'm mm. pronouncing that right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, is that still uh, in development? Is that something that may be happening soon? Uh, it is. We've we've uh, we've had a a terrific writers' room for about a year, and we are um, to you know the the point earlier about the the pandemic. One of the sort of remarkable um, and unexpected. Uh, benefits of this otherwise trying and in many cases painful time has been that the projects that that we've been working on uh have been allowed to gestate and and you know simmer and the writing has been able to happen without that more typical urgency of of pre-production and production where suddenly you're looking at locations and auditions and set design and production design and props and things when you're just trying to figure out the bones and the framework. And so the, the beauty of this, of this time on Demimon, for example, is we've been able to not just outline the season, but write the season um, and not just, you know, roughly understand where we want to go over the course of the series, but actually plot it out. And so I feel like we're, you know, we're, we're in a place that feels like it, you know, it should be more the norm than it, than it ever is uh, to really kind of know where you're going to go. But to, to your earlier question, that was a really good one about 
about planning things out. I just feel like, you know, that that's one of the things that has, you know, this time has allowed us to do in a way that I don't think we've ever had the uh, the luxury before. I can't wait to see that. Very quickly, oh, awesome. I'm obligated yep. as a writer for Collider to ask about Collider. I know it's a project that's been in development for a long time that you and Edgar Wright were working on. Is that still bubbling up or is that kind of- You know, I, Edgar has since gone off to do, you know, a few other movies and and it's, it, it's not something that, I, that is actively in the works right now, but it, you know, obviously it's, it's an idea that I, I love that Edgar came to me with and, um, you know, he's a dear friend and I, I can't wait to do something with him, but uh, I don't know if Collider's going to be it. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for taking Please. the time. Uh, it, my pleasure. Thank you. I really can't I wait really to appreciate see this project. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.